Good morning. Let's begin this morning by taking your Bible, if you have it, and opening it to Matthew chapter 5 to begin with. I'm spending a fair amount of time here in the Sermon on the Mount. If you've been here for most of these studies, I trust you recognize it covers a number of diverse topics. But there is a common element to just about everything in the Sermon on the Mount, and that Jesus teaches and makes it very apparent that what is spoken of here and what God requires cannot be fulfilled in your own strength. What the sermon communicates in, a most, in its most basic form is that mankind is without the righteousness necessary to enter the kingdom of God. He's helpless to gain this righteousness through any of his own personal efforts, and that's what the grace of God is all about. In fact, as he began this sermon, he said in, in uh, verse 20 of Matthew 5, For I said to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will be, will be by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And he said that because on a human level, they were the relative standard of righteousness as man compared himself to man. And so... If they couldn't get in, well then who could go in? And he raised the bar even further at the end of chapter 5 by saying, in verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so if you're going to go to heaven, you're going to have to be perfect. And so I guess we're all in deep doo-doo here. See, that was Jesus' way of saying that you need an imputed righteousness outside of yourself, given to you by grace, put to your account. And this is something only God can provide. And this is something that every individual must be, be willing to receive by faith. You know, the Sermon on the Mount is a way of stripping away the pretense of self-righteousness. It brings the standard back to God himself. In fact, the purpose of the sermon was to instruct those who believed on Christ as Messiah. Principles of righteousness at the same time was condemn those who had not yet done so. And throughout the sermon, Jesus raises the level of righteousness from a relative human standard to vine standard, which means, again, we're all in trouble because the bottom line is we haven't made the grade. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that means all of us, which means there's no difference between you and the worst sinner you can think of. Whatever comes to mind, as much as you want to think you're different on a relative scale, God says you haven't made it, and there's no difference. We're all condemned. See, God's righteousness is perfection, and you may not have fallen as short as someone you can think of, but the fact is you haven't made it, and so you're in the same boat. The boat is sinking. It's sinking into hell, and you need to be rescued. And God gave the Ten Commandments to show how you fall short, and it says don't lie. We all lie. It says honor mom and dad. You haven't done that one. Uh, when you've hated someone in your heart, Jesus said, that's the same as murder and so forth. And so we're all guilty, and that's, again, the purpose of God's law is to show you you're guilty. Romans 3.19 says, We know whatever the law says. It says to, to those who are under law, to what end? That every mouth, not some, every mouth would be stopped and all the world would become guilty before God. We're all guilty. And so we're all in a world of hurt. And the purpose of the law, again, was not to declare you righteous in God's sight, but show you just how sinful you are. It makes sin exceedingly sinful. But it also had another purpose. It was to drive you to Christ so you could be saved. Galatians 3 makes this clear. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, our school teacher, if you will, to bring us to who? Christ, that we being justified, notice not by works, but by faith. And after the faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. The law has done its job because you become a child of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what... The Spirit of God wants every unsaved individual to understand here today and every day is that those that are trying to work their way to heaven are actually under a curse. It's written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And we've all failed in many of these things and therefore we're under a curse. And this is where Jesus Christ comes in. He fulfilled every demand of the law. Thus we enter into Christ, we enter into his fulfillment of the law, and we're no longer under its curse because three verses later we're told in Galatians 3.13 that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us, a curse in our place. 
For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. And so the purpose of Jesus coming, God becoming a man on the person of, of Jesus Christ, was to go to the cross of Calvary and there take upon himself your punishment and mine for the sins we did, as he never sinned. That's called amazing grace and love. And so the good news of the gospel is that on that cross, in love, Jesus Christ paid your penalty in full. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to whoever, and it's open to anybody, believes in him, trusts him and him alone as their only means by which to enter heaven because of his work on the cross, you won't perish but have everlasting life. He cried out on that cross, it is finished. That means your bill and my bill has been paid. There's nothing left to do. There's no other work required. You simply have to take it by faith because he, ro- he rose from the grave. He lives forevermore, and the life that he possesses, he gives freely on one condition, faith. God has provided only one way. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But everyone has to make their own personal choice to accept that. And so the answer is given in Acts 16, verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. And the moment you do, you have a righteous standing before God, not because you've earned it or deserved it, but... It was put to your account through your faith in Christ, and that then puts you in a position by which you can actually fulfill, and this is true for the people that trusted Christ as the Messiah when he gave this sermon on earth. They were given the capacity to walk by faith and fulfill what was required of them. The unsaved do not in any way, shape, or form. And so Romans 4 or 5 tells us, him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, it's his faith that counts him for righteousness before God. And so, to fill the righteous requirements of the sermon, you need a righteousness in your position. In other words, to function, we can say it this way, or live like a child of God, you have to be a child of God. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, who was very religious, who was very uh, equipped to teach, he was the teacher in Israel, and he understood the law perfectly, that he needed to be born again. Because without new life from God, it's humanly impossible for anyone to fulfill what's required here in this sermon because you don't have the capacity to do it. Now, as we think of the portion we're going to go through today, we're going to talk a little bit more about prayer and ways. And this is not the first time we're going to be in Acts or. Matthew 7, that Christ has, not, has talked about prayer. We know earlier in this sermon, in beginning in verse 9 of chapter 6, Christ taught the disciples how to pray in light of the dispensation they were living in. Um, and though there's some concepts that we can take for ourselves in our dispensation, that's not a prayer to be said today or repeated today as it often is. He did get some principles on prayer, though, that do apply today in the beginning of Matthew 6. He said in verse 5, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the corners of the streets, so they can be seen of men. Wrong motives. I, he sure, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Uh, they're not going to get anything from God there, because they're not only really not praying to him. But you, when you pray, you go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And he goes on to say, verse 7, When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And so, you know, when it comes to prayer, it's something that's obviously very important to God. And in this dispensation, we have, I guess, a different basis to pray and a different means to pray. Christ instituted a different thing for this dispensation on the eve of his crucifixion, what's often referred to as the upper room discourse. He said, whatever you ask in my name, we are to pray in the name of Christ now. He said, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, that will I do it. And so we have a different means. In fact, he said in John 15, 7 and 8, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you wish, there's a relationship here through Christ It'll be done for you. By this, my again, what's the goal again? Twice it's mentioned, that my Father is glorified and that you bear much fruit and prove to be disciples. 
same discourse. He says in the next chapter, in that day you will ask me no questions. Most certainly I tell you whatever you may ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. He's instituting something new here. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so Christ is now the means by which we approach our Heavenly Father. In fact, we're encouraged to do that. Romans 5, 1 and 2 tells us, have been justified by faith, that means declared righteous through faith in Christ. Notice we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through Jesus, we also have what? Access, perfect tense in the Greek. Perfect access, again, by faith into this grace in which we stand. and We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So Christ is our access. This is repeated in Ephesians 2. For through him, Jesus Christ, we both, that's both Jews and Gentiles, that are one in Christ now, by one spirit we have access to the Father. And so you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God. Ephesians 3 again, according to the inter- eternal purpose which he accomplished, that's Christ, or God accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom, notice, we have boldness and access and with confidence, how? Through faith in him. And so we're privileged in this dispensation to be blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In fact, we're implored through the book of Hebrews, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast our confession. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are yet without sin. And so let's draw near, let's come boldly with confidence to what? A throne of grace. You don't have to earn your way there. It's free that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the whole purpose of praying, one of the purposes of praying, rather, is to obviously cast our burdens upon our Heavenly Father who cares for us. But those who trusted Christ as the Messiah in the dispensation in which the sermon was given also had the same Heavenly Father, and they were to come to him as well. You know, if you think about this, and I thought about it a lot the last couple of weeks. The f- large focus of this particular sermon is God the Father. I mean, if you look at chapter 5, even verse 16, this is again to those who are saved. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And, and what's the objective again? Glorify your Father in heaven. In chapter 5, verse 45, if you're willing to be persecuted in honoring your Savior and doing good to those who hate you and praying for those who spitefully use you, he says that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. It's an, indi- it's an indicator of your childhood, your status as sons in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. 548, just as you should be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. 6.1, take heed you don't do terrible deeds before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 4, that your charitable deed may be in secret, that your Father in heaven, who sees in secret, will he himself reward you openly. Verse 6, but you, when you pray, go in your room, when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in heaven, in the secret place, then your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Verse 8, therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Verse 9, you're to pray to our Father in heaven. Verse 14, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you don't, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's in the context of fellowship. Verse 18, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but your Father who is in secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Verse 32, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, but your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. And we're going to see it even 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? And so the Heavenly Father is a strong emphasis in this particular sermon. 
And only one who is saved by Almighty God can call God his own Heavenly Father. And these verses bring out his righteousness, the fact that he is to be glorified, the fact that he loves you, the fact that he cares for you. He's the focus. It reminds me of what we read in Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how shall not with him also freely, graciously give us all things? You have a God who's your father who loves you supremely. And this becomes apparent in our text today as well. Now, this sermon is for those, part of this sermon as we discern it and rightly divide it, it's for those who have accepted Jesus the Messiah, it puts forth righteous principles to be employed by faith as Jews until the kingdom is set up. And there's also some transdispensational principles which are to be applied by faith for the believer today, and we need to discern those things, otherwise wrong conclusions are drawn. Now we think this chapter 7 here, he began this section we're in, verse 1, by saying, judge not that you be not judged. He's speaking of judgment here, and he warns them to not be self-righteous and condescending and have horrible motives and selfish objectives when judging others. For if you do that, you'll be judged the same way back to you. And so you're not to be judging your brother in a very demeaning and condemning way. Instead, you take heed to yourself. Instead of being the big speck inspector when you've got a beam flowing out of your eyeball, you are to be gracious and kind and take heed to yourself. And as you take heed to yourself, then you're in a position to come alongside your brother and to help him, not condemn him. And he says in verse 6 that you need to be discerning. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And then he jumps into verse 7 here. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, verses 7 through 11, and then we have an application of verse 12, obviously have to do with prayer, even though the word prayer or pray is not mentioned in them. We've already studied a few different times in this sermon about prayer. We already saw in verse 8 of chapter 6 that your Heavenly Father knows what you need of before you ask Him, but He still expects you to ask. You know, people still struggle with this. If God already knows what he's going to do, why does he want us to ask? Right? You ever wonder why the Lord has commanded prayer? You know, when you're praying, you're not informing God. I I trust you recognize that. He knows. He already knows. We're not praying to instruct God because he already has a will. We're actually inviting God. Do you look at your prayers inviting God in a way? We invite God to do his will in us and through us when we pray. See, God wants to do something in you. He wants to do something through you. And he wants to do those things through the vehicle of prayer. See, prayer is actually an indication of the quality of your walk with the Savior. It's a byproduct of enjoying fellowship with him. You know, John 57, it says, if you remain or abide in me, as Christ says in my words in you, this is the relationship we have with Christ. Ask whatever you wish. This is a, there's a textual variant here. Some there's a command to ask. Some there's an indicative mood. You will ask. It's a byproduct of enjoying the, the fellowship. And notice it'll be done for you. God wants you to abide in him and enjoy this relationship. And part of enjoying that relationship is communication 
and prayer. God does not simply want to give us things. He wants our fellowship. So he says, when you're abiding in me, it's going to be reflected through prayer. And that way, God and us get to enjoy the relationship and see his work done together. You know, God could do it without you, but you can't do it without him. And that's why just a few verses earlier, he says, without me, Christ said, you can do nothing. But you see, he's chosen not to do it without you because God wants you to have fellowship with him and bear fruit for him. And so your walk with the Lord is going to be characterized if you're enjoying it through prayer. If you're saying you're enjoying the Lord and you're never praying, you're self-deceived. Prayer is a huge indication of how you're walking with the Lord. When you abide in him and he abides in you, you're going to be growing as you pray. This is why God oftentimes doesn't answer your prayer immediately, because he wants you to grow some more. And that's certainly implied in verses 7 through 11. You know, there's several other reasons I could cite about prayer, but what's being emphasized in conjunction with prayer here is the goodness of the Father. The goodness of the Father. You know, A.W. Tozer once wrote, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I thought that's insightful, isn't it? You know, if you've got a view of God other than the one you should have, your response to this invitation, which is actually a command to pray, is certainly going to fall short. You know, prayer is the greatest privilege you have. Have you thought about that? You get to talk to the one that knows everything, that always listens, that always cares, that feels your deepest pain, that knows your deepest desires, and has got a good and acceptable and perfect will for your life. And we can let our petitions be made known to him. We'll never be any stronger spiritually than our prayer life allows. That's why these sayings that come up over the years, like seven days without prayer makes one week. And that's not W-E-E-K, it's W-E-A-K. Now, you read these verses and people get pretty pumped up because it says, hey, whatever you ask, whatever you seek, whatever door we open, God's going to give it to us door we want open. And people tend to take this, well, this means just about everything. I mean, this is what the prosperity gospel is based on, these verses right here. And this false gospel says that God wants all Christians to be healthy and wealthy. And, you know, if you're not living in financial abundance and good health, you're not living the victorious Christian life. And all you need to do is stand on this promise right here. You've got to blab it and grab it and run with it as they say, right? Or name it and claim it. I don't know. I like blab it and grab it better. <laughs> you know, they would say your inheritance includes financial wealth and good health in this world and this time. And this is one of their primo verses right here. Verses 7 through 11, right? Ask, it'll be given to you. The reason you're not healthy, wealthy, and living in abundance and the reason you're sick is because you haven't asked and you haven't believed God what you're asking for. Is that what this is telling us? I mean, hey, let's start asking, baby. Let's ask. You know, ask for that. Ask for riches. Ask for a girlfriend or a new spouse or something else you crave. I mean, it makes no sense, right? I don't know why I said that. I... It's really not on my mind. wet. <laughs> you know, here's the balance. This is, the name and claimers never share this verse. Where do wars and fights come among you? Don't they come from your desires for pleasure? The war in your members? Mine, mine, all mine. You lust and you do not have, so you murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight in war. But you don't have because you do not ask, but the problem is, verse 3, you do not receive because why? You're asking this because you want to spend it on your pleasures. God is your genie. That's all he is to you. If he can't deliver the goods, I'm going to fight and kick and scream to get it on my terms. And don't you dare get in my way. And so what does James call these believers to think like this? Adulterers and adulterers because you're thinking just like the devil. Friendship with the world is an enmity with God. 
And so when we read these verses, it's not an incentive to go to, God, go to your Heavenly Father with a gimme so you can cater to your flesh in some selfish way. That's not the point at all. This is about doing the will of God in your life in accordance to what he taught them earlier to pray. He taught them earlier to pray, thy will be done, not give me the Powerball numbers. And so here's the invitation. Ask, seek, and knock. Verses 7 and 8. Ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So Jesus here invites and actually commands three times, in essence, to pray. Ask him for what we need. This is how the Amplified Bible states this. Keep on asking, it'll be given to you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking reverently, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who keeps on asking and receives, he who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking, the door will be opened. And the reason they translate it with the word keep in there because these are, this is in the present tense. These are present tense commands, which imply repetitious activity. This is in vain repetition, but this is repetitious activity. And so Jesus is really saying here to his disciples to be persistent in their prayer as needed, to ask again and again, to do it humbly, persistently, diligently. Clark, in his commentary, said it this way, ask with confidence, humility, seek with care and application, knock with earnestness and perseverance. But what he is saying here is that if you're going to benefit from this command, you have to be actively participating in the process. You have to ask. I mean, it's pretty simple, but it's kind of profound. We can't expect God to answer prayers that have never been prayed. And we learn, we need to learn to ask the Lord for our needs. We need to learn to take things to him. He desires to come, us to come before him with our needs, with an attitude of faith, believing he'll answer his prayers. What I find interesting, though, is he doesn't tell us what to ask for, does he? It just says ask. So what are we supposed to be asking for? I mean, a new Mercedes? That wouldn't be a bad deal, right? I mean, what if I prayed for it and it showed up on our driveway on Tuesday? Whoa, that'd be kind of wild, wouldn't it? You know, if that story got around, you think there might be a sudden increase in church attendance? Yeah. yeah. Would there be any increase in people who are saved? Probably not. But these promises are given here. They're based on need. They're presented in a context. And again, this is based primarily, first and foremost, on a heart that is purposed to do the will of God. But if you're going to benefit from this command, you have to seek passionately during the process. I mean, these are, there's a upward transmission here. We're going from asking to seeking. You're to seek with the purpose of finding. It reveals a commitment or a sense of urgency. It presents the idea of seeking diligently for something of great value. And when you're seeking for something of great value, what's implied there is it takes time and effort. Seek is obviously a much stronger term than asking. And there's serious participation in it. So we're asking, but not only are we asking, we're taking it to the next level. We're seeking. And then he says, you have to knock persistently as part of the process. That means there's patience involved, isn't there? Knock and it shall be opened to you. Prayer requires participation, passion. It requires patience. And so, this is why oftentimes you don't get an instant answer to your prayer. You know, the idea of knocking implies that we sense resistance. I mean, if the door were already open, there wouldn't be any need to knock. And so, there's obviously, again, a progression here, an increase in intensity communicated in these terms. There's passion involved. And God wants you to obviously persevere in prayer, doesn't he? 
I mean, does God want us to bang away to get him to act? Because, is, I mean, is that how this thing works? You've got to basically twist God's arm to get him to respond? No, God's purpose in all this is, basically, since we're more involved in the process, the greater our relationship with him becomes. The deeper, the richer, and more meaningful my communion with my Heavenly Father becomes. I mean, God doesn't want me to carry a cheat sheet in my back pocket, if you will. He wants a vital relationship with him. To enter into this relationship in a wholesale fashion. And so there's some intensity here about prayer. How is your prayer life? I mean, would you say that there's some intensity in your prayer life? Some passion? Some seeking? Some pouring out your heart, like our verse this morning said, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Is this relatable to you at all? Or just kind of lollygagging along and you occasionally thank God for your food and, and that's the extent of it. You know, look at the corresponding promises here. Six times. One, you asked, and what's the promise? It will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, it'll be open to you. And then in verse 8, he reiterates it again. For everyone who asks, receives. So it's a different word there. He who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open. Pretty powerful promises here given by the Savior. Now the implication here is that if it's not given to the ones who don't ask, it's not found by the ones who don't seek, and it's not open to the ones who don't knock. But specifically to those who ask, seek, and knock, they will receive, find, and have a door open to them. And so part of the design of your Christian life is to do these very things. You're not supposed to be on autopilot just kind of cruising along. Now it's interesting, in verse 8 he says what? For everyone who asks receives. Is this for everyone? Well, this is where you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. This is only good if God's your heavenly father, if you're his child. If God's not your father, you have no relationship with him. But if you are a child of God, God is your heavenly father, this applies to you. Now, is this a free-for-all? You know, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we see that there is some qualification here. I mean, if I pray anything, can I expect a positive answer? No. Now, we need to recognize that we need to pray in faith. Very clear in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is. And again, this doesn't mean that you believe God exists. You believe he is who he claims to be in the word of God. And what's the promise? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, not seek what he can give me. God, I got the gimmies here. If you could just help me out here. No, it's seeking him, and it's seeking him with diligence by faith because you want him glorified more than anything else. It's your greatest desire. You know, if you're not interested in doing the will of God for the glory of God, your prayers automatically default into the James 4 category, and they're not going to get past the ceiling. See, this is about diligently seeking the Lord. This assumes that you want more than anything else to do the will of God. What does 1 John 5, 14 and 15 tell us? This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, it doesn't say, it doesn't, it doesn't say if we ask anything, anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, again, key here, we know we have what we've asked of him. What a great encouragement. But again, am I asking according to his will? Do I want to see him glorified? Do I want to see his will done? You know, 1 John 3.22, earlier in this epistle, and whatever we ask, 
We receive of him, why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things which please him. Now sometimes people read this and say, well, you get to earn something from God by keeping his commandments. No, that's not what it means. This ties right together with what it means to abide. If I'm abiding in Christ and his words are abiding in me, I'm going to ask what I wish and it'll be done for you because there's an abiding relationship. The commands are a byproduct. They're fulfilled as a byproduct of me walking in the light as Christ is in the light. He's working in me and through me. And so those commands are being done. So I'm in tune with him and my prayers reflect the fact that I'm in tune with him. And so what I ask him, which is consistent with his will, says I'm going to receive, according to 1 John 3.22, because it's not about me, it's about him. So important. I mean, this is why earlier in this epistle, in chapter 6, verse 30, or this uh, sermon, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek the will of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. And so if you're stuck in this mindset that prayer is all about you and it's not about your relationship with the Lord and seeing him honor, you're going to have trouble. You're just going to have trouble. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Where's your heart this morning? Psalm 34, 10, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. That's encouraged me many times, many times. It's not those who seek the good thing, it's those who seek the Lord. As a byproduct, lack no good thing. So God will reward the faithful with fervent prayers to do his will with their fulfillment. But to encourage you to see that your father is good, he makes a comparison. In verses 9 through 11. He's going from a lesser to the greater. Or what man is there among you? who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father who is in heaven will give good things to those who ask him? I mean, most fathers, even the ones that aren't very good, are going to feed their kids. And what parent among us isn't going to give their child the food they need? If they ask for bread, you're going to give them a stone. Or if they ask for a fish, you give them a snake. Now, some want to say that the stone that Jesus was referring to was shaped like the bread they used to eat back then, and that there were snakes that looked like fish, and so there was an element of deceptions. And he's saying even human fathers who love their children will not deceive their children by promising one thing and then giving another. No loving father would do that, and sometimes people have that view of God. I mean, there's some pretty bad parents out there, but even among the bad ones, I don't know there's many that would try to fool their kid in that regard. What's interesting here is, again, Jesus compares God to a human father. That's like comparing a toothpick to a sequoia. But Jesus calls his audience evil. Did you notice that? Verse 11, if you then being evil, that is evil. Jesus said that parents are evil. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Even evil parents feed their kids and don't seek to trick their kids with some of these vital things. I mean, if we who are sinful care for our children, how much more does our Father in Heaven care for His children? If we have a desire and ability to provide for our children, how much more would your Heavenly Father? I mean, if bad, evil parents do this, you're talking about God that's got no trace of evil in him. He's perfect in goodness and holiness and love. Would he give you a stone if you asked for bread? Would he give you a snake if you asked for a fish? Absolutely not. You know, Jesus goes beyond the encouragement of merely saying that God is your father. He says that, God is always better than your earthly father. And you might have a father that loves you dearly and only has your best in mind, but boy, I tell you what, there's no comparison. God is always better than your earthly father. Because according to this verse, all earthly fathers are evil. By comparison. It's a relative comparison to God. 
How unflattering, Jesus. He's certainly bringing to attention the universal sinfulness of human beings. He assumes his disciples are all evil. He doesn't choose a softer word. He doesn't say sinful or weak. He says evil. It's the strongest word for evil in the Bible. Poneros. And these people, his disciples are saved here. But God, your Father, is not evil in any way, shape, or form. He loves you supremely. This is why having an understanding of who your Heavenly Father is is so critical. So critical. You know, people I've talked to over the years have limited their understanding of the Father of God based on the experience they have with their own human father who abandoned them when they were two or whatever. God has none of the sins or limitations or weaknesses or hang-ups of an earthly father. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. End of story. But what a powerful point. Even fallen, sinful, evil fathers have enough common grace to do what is right and give good things to their children. And there's terribly abusive fathers. God is always better. In him there is no evil. So the argument is strong. If the earthly father gave you good things, or even if he didn't, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask? Now what if your child asks for a serpent instead of a fish? What would a heavenly father do? Would he give him a serpent or would he give him a fish? He'd give him a fish. Because notice, did you notice the words much more in this verse? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? How much more? You know what? God only gives good things. Isn't that what James 1.17 tells us? He only gives good things. And your Heavenly Father knows what you need. And he, the good that you might think you need might not be the good that he knows you need. Isn't that what we had in the devotion last month? Psalm 84, 11 and 12, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, blesses the man who trusts in you. No good thing. But again, what is good from God's perspective? He's not only going to give you what you asked for, but he might give you something that you don't necessarily think is good. And if you're not thinking straight, you might think, I asked God for a fish and he gave me a snake. That's impossible. See, this is what the psalmist who understood it correctly said. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. End of story. So teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Notice there's affliction here. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. Here's some good things. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Oh, how is affliction good? Because I can learn something about my father that I wouldn't learn otherwise. So God says, you know what's good? This trial I gave you. No. Yes. What about Paul here? Lest I should be exalted over measure, the abundance of revelation, a thorn in the flesh. Now, the agent of this was Satan. Concerning this thing, I said, Lord, this can't be good. I prayed three times that you take it away. And he said, no. You're going to learn something that you won't learn otherwise, which is good for you. That my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So what did Paul say? This is good. I'm going to boast in my infirmities. Why? So the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm going to take pleasure in these things and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong in him. Oh, the thorn was good. We sing that song, Children of the Heavenly Father. One of the stanzas goes, What he takes or what he gives us shows the Father's love so precious. You know, what you think about God influences your friendship with him. It affects how much glory you're willing to give him. And you see, the trouble is, if I don't allow the truth of the word of God to shape my perception of God the Father, I'm going to allow my imagination to do that 
and that's bad. You know, invariably, everyone who conceives God who they want to be is a God just like them. I've seen it over and over again. God must think like me. You create him in your own image. And you can be like the Jews who had a zealous, they were zealous for God, but it wasn't based on knowledge. And it requires thinking. You know, God despises suffering. He never sins. He never tempts anyone else to sin. He claims nothing touches us first without first receiving his nod. Psalm says, all my days were ordained for me before any of them came to be. He's in charge of it all. But it's interesting. In Lamentations, it says, is not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? He's in charge. But it all works together for the child of God. You know, God is determined to steer even what he hates to accomplish his good and what he loves. I mean, here, let me give you an illustration. He was a public figure in his country, although he was not well known internationally. Due to his wide-ranging charitable works spurred by his religious convictions, he became a hero among many of the lower class and even many of the sophisticates. But a certain, in certain political quarters, he, quarters he, was not view, he was viewed as a threat, rather. And the group that took responsibility for his seizure acted at night. As with many desperate organizations, they sought to paint their actions with a veneer of legality. A kangaroo court was convened. The charges stated. The defendant declared guilty. He was taken down a hall and thrown to some thugs who beat him skillfully to a pulp. Then they attached him to a crude torture instrument where he was stretched unmercifully and had various parts skewered. As intended, the widely loved man did not survive the procedure. Outraged and grief-stricken friends remembered him as a humble, helpful person who has always had time for others. His murderers were never brought to justice. And you read that and think, well, how could God allow that to happen? Well, that was just a sketchy description of Jesus. How could God let that happen to Jesus? Because it was good for you and for me. See, God's answer might not be what you have desired or expected, but it'll be always just what you need. And so what we can take away from these verses in general, we need to persevere in prayer. The process of prayer is important. While we keep praying, God keeps working. In prayer, we seek God's will. And the promise is, in essence, no good thing will be kept from you. But we really need to understand these verses in the context. And this is where people can miss it. See, because he makes an application in verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, this is in the context of judging still, verse 1 of chapter 7. Do also to them, for this is the sum of the idea there of the law and the prophets. In other words, the whole law as it relates to mankind living in this world can be summed up by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the golden rule that the unsaved world is familiar with. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's another way of saying, love your neighbor as yourself. But that therefore is important. This is the bridge between the first six verses and what we read in verses 7 through 11. He's saying, in essence, how can you judge correctly? How can you keep from falling in the pattern of the scribes and Pharisees of self-righteously condemning others because they fail to live up to your standards and at the same time have discernment to tell the difference between the dogs and the hogs and, and so forth? It takes both humility and insight that it's impossible to have as a natural person. So I'm to seek, I'm to ask, I'm to seek and to knock because God says I want to give you good things here. What are those good things? 
I think what helps us understand the point of this passage is what we read in the parallel account that Luke gave of this very thing. He said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father will give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So we have a difference here. We have the Holy Spirit involved. And what I believe the Savior is saying in this context is that well, God will give you what you stand in, in need of through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to love others like you should so that you won't judge in a condescending, self-righteous, censorious manner and you have the discernment to recognize the hogs and the dogs and you'll love others the way, in this case, in this context, the way the law was given to Israel is they were to love others like themselves. See, when Jesus was asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, with all your mind. And the first, that's the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is the summation of the law. And so this golden rule is a summation of the law to the Jew living at this time that had trusted Christ as their Savior. And so the context surrounding asking, seeking, and knocking is for wisdom from the Holy Spirit and loving and judging correctly, not getting everything on your wish list. This is dealing with judgment. In fact, the rest of chapter 7 is about the judgment that's coming in very ways. And so he's going to say next, you've got to enter by the narrow gate. He says in verse 15, beware of the false prophets. He talks about fruit. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, verse 21. He who does the will of my Father in heaven, which is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks about building on the right foundation. Proper discernment in these matters of judgment require the Holy Spirit's power and enlightenment. And so when you compare these two, you recognize in a context, this can't be ripped from his context like the health and wealth group there and, and says, hey, I prayed for a new car, I'm waiting. Maybe it'll show up today, right? So in the context, our Lord is making a provision or asking, telling them to pray for a provision to those who are saved to live according to the righteous principles he has given during this whole Sermon on the Mount. Do you realize as a believer in Christ you're not to live by the golden rule? That's actually a step down. Because on the eve of his crucifixion, Christ said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Like, we want to be loved? No, as I have loved you, that you love one another. Oh, the bar's been raised. To do the golden rules, you're stepping down. You're to love others like Christ loved you. He just raised the bar right through the roof. Isn't that interesting? And so understand this in context here. This is about, this was written to the Jews. It's information given to those who had trusted Christ as Messiah, that the Holy Spirit would give them the wisdom they need to fulfill the golden rule which was acceptable in their dispensation. We've been given the Holy Spirit who lives within us. We've been given the capacity through him to love one another like Christ loved us. And so we don't want to lower the bar to the golden rule. We want to walk in the light as Christ is in the light and allowing him to work in us and through us so we love one another with a pure heart fervently. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, not because you keep the golden rule, but because you love one another. And so it's important to understand this. We certainly understand that prayer is important. And what an invitation to pray for God to work in us and through us so that his will can be done and we can be vessels of mercy to one another. Isn't that encouraging? You can see throughout this whole sermon what's important to God is the glory of the Father, righteousness being administered, and love pervading all things. It's always been God's way. Always. That's what's important to him. And so when you got the gimmies and you're thinking, Damn, I need to ask, I need to seek, I need to knock, you're wasting your time. 
You're looking to build up your own flesh. You need to, you're looking to consume something upon your lust instead of humbly saying, you know what, Lord, there's nothing else that means anything to me than your will being done, and I know your will has to do with people and relationships and loving one another. So give me the wisdom I need to love my brother like you loved me and to love one another like you loved me because you put that love in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And so if you're looking for something to pray for this week, why don't you pray, why don't you seek, and why don't you knock that God would give you the wisdom to love your brother or sister in Christ in the way that he's loved you. And you know what? You'll have peace in your heart. And you want to look out the window and wonder, well, I wonder what if it's coming. You won't even bother. You know, it's funny when we do pray, our prayers certainly reflect what's going on in our heart. And if I've got the gimmies, and if my prayers only amount to material things or comfort or health, I'm aiming really low. I'm aiming really low. I'm missing the point of my existence. I exist to do the will of God for the glory of Jesus Christ. Not that you can't pray for those things. You're welcome to pray about all those things, and you should. But what's your goal? What's your objective? What's the higher purpose in view? Is it all, all, is it all about you, or is it about the Lord Jesus Christ who gave us all for you? Hopefully, this passage makes more sense to you now. And we can see it in context. And the transpensational principle, if you want to get us, pray so that we can love one another and have the wisdom to not judge and drive others into the ground. Our time is gone. Let's pray. Father, we're just humbled again by who you are, how you love us, what you provide for us, and how that you are a good, good Father in every sense of the word. And you always have our best in mind. And you want us to enjoy the relationship that we have through Christ with you, to come boldly to a throne of grace, to find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And we see that the greater objective of it all is that we love one another like Christ has loved us. Help us to truly process these things, to understand them, and to apply them by faith for the glory of our dear Father and our dear Savior who gave us all for us, though we deserve help. So we thank you for these things and we pray in his precious name. Amen.